The Committee on Public Information, also known as the Creel Commission, was the first modern mass propaganda system dedicated to shaping public opinion, manipulating information, marginalizing the public, suppressing dissent, and turning a pacifist population into ravenous warmongers that wanted to destroy everything German. With the Great War raging in Europe, the majority of Americans took an isolationist stance and did not wish to involve themselves in the turmoil of the Old World. President Woodrow Wilson courted the anti-war sentiment and ran for re-election on the platform that he kept us out of war. However, the Wall Street bankers and American businessmen had lent tremendous sums of money to the British and the French and were worried that if the Central Powers were victorious, they would not be repaid. After Wilson won re-election in 1916, he immediately, at the behest of U.S. business interests, began mobilizing the war effort. To accomplish this, Wilson enlisted the help of liberal intellectuals such as George Creel, Walter Lippmann, who coined the term manufacturing consent, and Edward Bernays, who would later become known as the father of the public relations industry, to help whip up anti-German sentiment and create a state propaganda system. They applied their understanding of herd mentality and crowd psychology based on the idea that people were not moved by fact or reason, but rather by the skillful manipulation of emotions. The commission saw the public as political spectators that should not interfere with the affairs of the specialized class. Walter Lippmann referred to the American public as ignorant and meddlesome outsiders and said, the public must be put in its place so that each of us may live free of the roar and trampling of the bewildered herd. The reason for going to war, according to the Creel Committee, was that the U.S. was making the world safe for democracy. Under this pretext, they launched an all-out propaganda campaign to ratchet up pro-war sentiment. The speaking division recruited 75,000 specialists who became known as Four Minute Men for their ability to lay out Wilson's war aims in short speeches in schools, theaters, and other public venues. The film division produced newsreels intended to rally support by showing images in movie theaters that emphasized the heroism of the Allies and the barbarism of the Germans. And the foreign language newspaper division kept an eye on hundreds of weekly and daily U.S. newspapers published in languages other than English. In only six months, anti-German hysteria swept through the United States and hamburgers were renamed Liberty Sandwiches. Sauerkraut was called Liberty Cabbage. German shepherds were renamed police dogs, and the Boston Symphony Orchestra was even prohibited from playing Beethoven. The American Socialist Movement was at its zenith at this time, as were labor organizers, anarchists, and other left-wing radicals who would not march to the drumbeat of war. In retaliation, the Wilson administration instituted an intense suppression of civil liberties. In 1917, the U.S. passed the Espionage Act, which instituted domestic spying on citizens and made it against the law to interfere with the draft or make anti-American statements. This was an unprecedented attack on the free press. But in 1918, the government went farther and passed the Sedition Act, which prohibited any expression of opinions that negatively portrayed the war effort or interfered with the sale of government bonds. It also forbade disloyal acts or language regarding the United States government, its flag, and its armed forces. The U.S. smashed domestic dissent in a series of tactics known as the Palmer Raids, led by a young man named J. Edgar Hoover that resulted in over 5,000 arrests of left-wing radicals without cause or warrants, including Socialist Party presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs, who was sentenced to 10 years for speaking out against the war, saying, Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that is war in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars, and the subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives. The U.S. specifically targeted left-wing leadership. Anarchist Emma Goldman was deported, Big Bill Haywood fled to Soviet Russia, I.F. Stone was turned into a pariah as his publication Appeal to Reason, the fourth most popular paper in the country, was terminated, and labor organizer Joe Hill was executed by firing squad in Utah. After the war was over and Britain and France had begun to repay their debt, the committee immediately replaced the dreaded Hun with the dreaded Red, making sure America always had an enemy, resulting in what historian Dwight MacDonald called 
the psychosis of permanent war. George Creel would go on to aid Joseph McCarthy in his political witch hunt for left-wing agitators during the Cold War. However, Edward Bernays, who was Sigmund Freud's nephew and wrote the book Propaganda, would find much more lucrative work in the private sector. Bernays took the methods he had learned from the Creel Commission on how to drive pacifists to war and use them to distract the public from political engagement and direct them to the superficial things in life like fashionable consumption and turn consumer culture into an inner compulsion. Looking back in his later years, Bernays remarked, I decided if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was try to find some other words. So we found the words public relations. Bernays went to work for Madison Avenue and helped pioneer the golden age of advertising, accelerating the demand for commodity goods, not only as a means to generate wealth for the ruling class, but also as a technique of social control where the pursuit of self-interest would replace the public citizen with the private consumer, giving the public the false perception of civic engagement. Political activist Noam Chomsky commented on the goal of consumer culture, saying, you not only want to control very closely the lives of people in their work time, but you also have to control them in their off work time. What you have to do is turn them into passive, obedient consumers, get them trapped into consumerism, isolated from one another, atomized and control their beliefs. The advertising is there for a purpose. It's to turn people into creatures whose only goal in life is to max out their five credit cards and not to pay attention to what's going on in the world and let the rich and powerful guys do what they want without interference. Thanks for watching.